Before we get started today, we have a few announcements. Wednesday night prayer service. This is for everybody here and anybody that you want to invite to come and pray. Anybody's welcome. Hayride and Bonfire, October the 21st at 6 p.m. This is not just for us. This is for anybody we want to invite. This is for the community. This is for anybody listening uh, that wants to come and join us and fellowship. You're welcome to be here. We're going to have hot dogs, hot chocolate, all sorts of food, fun, and games. Ladies Bible Study, October the 28th at 5 p.m. This is not just for the ladies here. This is for anybody listening, anybody who uh, you want to invite or anybody that wants to come, come and be with us. I won't be here, but it's a ladies Bible study. Dedication service is Saturday, November the 4th at 7 p.m. Uh, invite your friends, invite your family. Let's get a good crowd here. Uh, it's the dedication for our church. Um, my pastor that I grew up under is going to perform the service, and we're looking for a good time in the Lord. So invite anybody you want, and let's all come and have a good time. That's all our announcements. While everybody's standing, if you have your Bibles today, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to begin with verse 4. This is a very familiar story. I think everybody that even claims to be a Christian, whether they really are or not, I think everybody knows this story. But verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And his staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And you can be seated this morning. Thank you for standing for the reading of the Word of God. I want to talk to us for a little while this morning. I'll try to be quick. I know we got food waiting on us. My wife's already been joking with me down coming down here like, I'm going to do this and that so you ain't long-winded this morning. So I'm going to try to be quick, but I hope this speaks to someone here today. Meeting or facing the enemy on his terms. Facing the enemy on his terms. As I've already said, this is a very familiar story. It's probably a favorite among many people today. But I want to point out some things about this battle of, between David and Goliath. Some things I point out will be old to some of you, and I'm hoping that there's going to be some new things. Matthew 13, verse 52 says, 
Jesus spoke unto them and said, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. So there will be some old things today, but I hope I also bring out some new things. But going back to the beginning of this chapter, the Philistines had gathered together to battle against Israel. And Israel had gathered together and set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on this side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And they were kind of at a stalemate. Neither one was going to leave their mountain. Neither one wanted to leave the safety of the mountain and try to uh, climb the mountain and overtake the other one. They were, they were at a standoff. It was kind of like King of the Hill. We used to play that when we was kids. And if we didn't have a kid we'd, or a hill, we'd make anything the hill. We'd make it the bed. We'd make it the doorway. We'd make it the trampoline. Whatever we was on, we would play King of the Hill. And it was always easier to hold the top of the hill than it was to climb up the hill and knock the one off of the top of the hill that was standing at the top. And this is where the two armies have found themselves. Both were at the top of the hill and neither one wanted to climb the other hill, the other mountain, and knock them off the top of it. But in the Philistine army was a champion, Goliath of Gath. And I want everybody to say Gath. Yeah. It's important to remember that Goliath was from Gath. And he went out of the camp and he stood and cried to the armies of Israel. And here's what he said. He starts off by asking two questions. Why are you come out to set the battle in array? And he said, Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Have you ever noticed how the enemy usually starts off with a question or a question-like statement? All throughout the Word of God, when the enemy would attack, most of the time, or a lot of the times, he started off with a question. Going back to the book of Genesis, verse, or chapter 3, verse 1. When the serpent came to Eve, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God not said that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. Are you, are you, can you not eat of every tree? He asked a question. Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, when Moses and Aaron told Pharaoh to let God's people go, what did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should hearken to his voice and let Israel go? Most of the time when the enemy comes against us, he's going to start off with a question or a question-like statement. And I want to give an example of that. When Jesus was in the wilderness and the devil came and tempted him in Matthew chapter 4 verse 3, the devil said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If, if you're who you say you are, he questioned who he was. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The enemy loves to make you question. He loves questioning. He likes to make you question who he is. What did Goliath say? Am not I a Philistine? Don't, don't you know who I am? And he wants you to question who you are. Are, what did Goliath say? Are you not servants to Saul? And then once his questions are thrown out there, and you're trying to get the answers, 
He throws the terms out. Here were Goliath's terms. Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Goliath had came down from the mountain and was standing in the valley called Elah. And he had turned the valley into his arena. Here is where he could showboat. Here is where he could command the audience, not only of Israel, but he also had his army's eyes upon him. Here in this valley where he stood with the laughs and the sneers and the cheers of the Philistines behind him and the shame and reproach of Israel in front of him, here was his turf. This was his valley. He was the one standing in it. He controlled it. It was his. He had came down into it. He stood in it and he owned it. He owned the field. This is where he wanted the battle to take place so that his championship-like status could be even more glorious in the sight of his comrades. But it was also desired, a desired place because not only would his army see him in his glory, but Israel would have to watch as he destroyed the man that they chose to come down to him. All eyes would be on him and the man chose to face him. It's what he wanted. He wanted everyone to see. Choose you a man and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me. I'm, again, I'm, I'm going through his terms. He said, choose a man, let him come down. And here's the rest of the terms. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, everybody say fight and kill. Then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. The turf or the ground of the valley was his and he stood in it. And the terms were clear. Choose you a man and let him come down to me. It's football season right now. And you'll hear the sayings, and I don't know who's playing. I'm not, I know nothing about football other than just what I hear through the grapevine. So I'm just going to use names of different teams for the examples. But I've heard these things before. And you hear things during football season like, it's going to be hard for Alabama to beat Florida down there in the swamps. That's, that's Florida's turf. That's their ground. That, this, this, is, this is ours. You're on our terms. You're on our turf. And you're not going to beat us on our turf. It's hard to beat a gator in the swamp. You hear stuff like, and if I'm wrong, you know, y'all football fans, forgive me, but uh, you hear stuff like LSU is going to be tough to beat on a Saturday night down there in the bayou. Tennessee better tighten up and play harder. See, the bayou's their turf. And they don't just lay down and let the other team win on their turf. They're, they're tough to beat on their turf. And that's where Goliath was. He was on his turf. He was in his valley. Come down to me. Come down here where I am. Choose you a man and face me. See, he had everything just right. He had the position that he wanted. He stood where he wanted to stand. The sun was probably at his back. That way his enemy had to look into the sun and the, and the light was in his eyes. The scripture even says he had one that bare a shield that went before him. So before you could get to him, 
You was going to have to go through the man that had the shield, so he thought he had it all just right. He was a champion. He had never been defeated. A champion is someone who has defeated all rivals. And not only was he champion, but he'd set the terms. Choose you a man and let him come down to me. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now I want us to notice what David said and what David did. Remember, Goliath asked the question, Are ye servants to Saul? Let's look at verse 32. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, thy servant. Are you not servants to Saul? David said, Saul, I'm your servant. Don't let no man's heart fail because of him. I'll go. And what did he say? Choose a man, let him come to me, that we may fight together. And what did David say? I'll go and I'll fight with this Philistine. So here goes David down into the valley of Elah. And verse 40 says that David drew near to the Philistine. David came down there on his turf where he was at. According to his terms. Well, yeah, okay, that, that's the terms, that's fine. You're down there in the valley, that's fine. You're on your turf. You're, you're, it's according to your terms, that's great. Here I am. See, sometimes we've got to face the enemy on his terms. And we know the story how David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and killed the giant. And verse 51 says that when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. See, Goliath was their champion. The enemy will always make the giant look like something that has never been beat. The enemy will always make the giant look like something that has never lost and has defeated all rivals. David was just a youth and this giant was a man of war from his youth. David was just a lad, just a young boy. And this man was an older man. This giant was an older man and he had survived the battles and the wars of days gone by. He was experienced. He was their champion. But David also had his champion. His champion had delivered him out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. And he said, my champion will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. His champion was the Lord, the captain of the Lord's host. When David got to the battle that day, what happened in verse 20? It says that the host was going forth to the fight. When Joshua went out and viewed Jericho, and he looked over against him, and he saw a man standing with his sword drawn and in his hand, he drew near to him and he asked him, Are thou for us? or for our adversaries. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord's host am I now come. Captain here means master. Exodus 15 and 3 tells us that the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. David said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. The captain is always where his host is. It's like that song that says, my champion, you fight for us. Like the song we sang this morning, he wears the victor's crown. He's never lost a battle. 
He's never been defeated. And there's nothing, there's no adversary, there's no foe that can stand before him. And David knew who his champion was. His champion was the master, the name of the Lord, the God. And we have the same master today. We have the same God, the same name of the Lord. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the master. He told his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 13, You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. The same God that delivered David is the same God that delivers us. He is the true champion. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself and I want to get back on point with David and Goliath here. So, Verse 52. The Philistines fled. And verse 52 says that the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines till thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded fell down by the way to Sharem, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. Now remember in verse 4, Goliath was of Gath. And I've said in another message that when God strikes our enemy, his blow will be so devastating and so powerful that it will pierce all the way back to the root of that problem. Goliath was of Gath and the blow was felt all the way back to the gates of Gath and Ekron. The wounded fell all the way back to that city that the giant came from. If you're fighting battles and you're facing a giant, don't let your heart fail because of him. The master's going to step in. And when he does, the giant that you're facing is going to fall on his face to the ground. And the blow will be so powerful that it and so devastating that it will pierce all the way back. That devil and hell and all its army that sent their champion to fight you is going to feel the wrath and the punishment of the sword of the Lord. The wounded fell back, or fell down all the way back to the city that their champion came from. Now that's powerful. I don't care who you are. But the Lord also showed me something new with this. Remember, every scribe brings out of his treasure things new and old. We need the old, but we also need some new. Here's some new. It was new to me anyway. Israel stood on the mountain on one side and the Philistines stood on the mountain on the other side. And the valley was between them. As I've said, the valley was Goliath's turf. He stood in it. He owned it. It was his. And he also made the terms of the battle. Had David never came to the battle, they might have stayed on the mountain till the Philistines attacked. and They could have even won if they did attack. But here's the thing. They would have only kept the mountain that they stood on. The mountain would have been the only ground that they held. They could have held out siege after siege, attack after attack, but they would have only held that ground. When David met the enemy on his turf and on his ground, and according to his terms, when he killed Goliath, who had the valley? Who took over the ground? The valley's David's now because he's the wood standing in it. He had the ground. The valley was gained. There was ground gained. 
Not only did they have their mountain back here, but now they had came in to the valley out here in front of it. They held, David held the ground. The turf was his now. And then all of Israel pursued the Philistines all the way back to Gath and Ekron. Verse 53. And they returned from chasing the Philistines and spoiled their tents. The ground that the enemy had was now their ground. They not only gained the valley, but they gained the ground that the enemy was on. When David met the enemy on his turf, and according to his terms, he gained the valley, and Israel gained the ground that the enemy camped on, and they spoiled their tents. Sometimes we have to meet the enemy on his ground and on his terms. But when we do, and our captain shows up, the reward is great. We not only keep the ground we had, but we gain the valley, and we gain the ground of the enemy. And as they say, to the victor belong the spoils. I have one more point, and I'm coming to a close. There was another battle that took place on a similar battlefield situation one day. There was an enemy, and if you'll just let me say it like this, he held the valley. The enemy held the ground. This enemy had power, and he held dominion in the earth. Man was supposed to have dominion over every living thing on the earth. Genesis 1 and 28. And God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Man had dominion. Man owned the field. And when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they lost this dominion. The enemy now held the valley. Something they were supposed to rule over, something they were supposed to have dominion over, had now ruled over them, and he now held the dominion. We read part of it earlier, but now let's look a little closer at Matthew 4 and verse 8. This is when Jesus was in the wilderness, tempted of the devil. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou will fall down and worship me. Luke 4, verse 5 and 6. And the devil taketh him up into an high mountain and showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. Now where did the devil get it? He said, it's mine. He said, I got the power. It's delivered to me. And to whom I will, I give it. He got it from Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, he gained the dominion. And now he's trying to tempt Jesus with this power. But Jesus said in verse 8, in verse eight 
Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the scripture says, When the devil ended the temptation, he departed for a season. He didn't beat Jesus. He departed for a season. He couldn't trick God into worshiping him. So he departs and he's going to regroup and he's going to try something else. This time, death and hell is gathered together for war. And they are pitched on a mountain on the one side and God is pitched on a mountain on the other side. And the earth is the valley between them. And Satan steps into the valley of the earth because he holds the ground. He said, it's mine. It's, my, I, I, it's delivered to me. I have the power. I own the earth. And he steps into this valley. And I'm using this in, in a similar metaphor of comparing it with the same as David and Goliath. The turf was his, and he held the dominion. And he's crying, send me a man that we may fight together. And the term of the battle is death. See, the devil had the power of death, and he was also after the throne. Send me a man that we may fight together. And this time, this time it wasn't a shepherd boy that stepped out onto the battlefield. This time a lamb stepped out. And I can hear the devil, just like Goliath, when he said, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? Questioning again. When David got there, Who are you? Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And I can hear the devil with that same mockery. A lamb? Is that all you got? This is going to be a walk in the park. This is going to be a piece of cake. Am I not the devil? Don't you know who I am? And the lamb made him <laughs> on his terms. And the lamb was slain. And the lamb went to hell. Jesus went to hell. It's in the book. Yeah. Acts 22, Acts 2, verse 22 through 31. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Send me a man that we can fight together. Approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by Him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, 
neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore he, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. See, Jesus met the devil on his turf according to his terms and on his ground. And Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, defeated death. He destroyed him that had the power of death. He met the devil on his ground, on his turf, according to his terms. And the blow was so powerful and so devastating that it went all the way back to the place where it began. In the garden with man and that old serpent. The Bible says that the seed was going to crush Satan's head and that seed was Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21 For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22 For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Death has no more sting and grave has no more victory. And I'm coming to a close with this. Revelation 1 and 18. Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And what? I have the keys of death and hell. Guess who owns the turf now? Guess who's standing in the valley now? Guess who owns the ground now? Jesus said, I own it. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He overcame the world. He defeated death. The grave could not hold him. He bruised Satan's head. He destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And he holds the keys. And the ground is His. But He's still not done. He spoiled the tents of the enemy. Remember when Israel pursued, they turned, went back, and they spoiled the tents? Colossians 2 and 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He has all power in heaven and in earth. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. When he whooped the devil, the devil had to walk up to him and give him the power. The captain showed up. Hebrews 2 and 10. For it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing 
many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The captain showed up. The master showed up on the battlefield. The one who never lost a battle and never will. And I want to tell somebody today, keep fighting the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Hold fast that that you have, that no man takes your crown. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our captain has never lost a battle. It doesn't matter how bloody. It doesn't matter how bad. It doesn't matter how terrible it gets. He cannot be defeated. Even death could not stop the Lamb. We call Him Master and Lord. And we say, well, for so He is. Sometimes we have to meet the enemy on his terms. But the captain is with us. And I close with Psalm 23 where David said, He prepares a table before me where in the presence of mine enemies because he holds the victor's crown. As our praise team comes this morning and we close with a song, let's all stand.